active in the community services. He's a uh, member of the LinkedIn Rotary Club for me. But um, today he's going to give you a snapshot or summary of uh, his uh, four year study. And basically, part of the recipe of turning zero to zero. Okay, not for all zero. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Um, First, I would really appreciate uh, for all the faculty and the uh, grad students who come to my PhD dissertation. Um, Stanley over here got a mixed feeling, been here six years, and the last four years been working on this project. So we still, let's just uh, get into it. Um, I only have four parts of uh, this whole dissertation, so uh, short and sweet. Uh, first, I'm just going to talk about uh, why we want to build this irrigation app from crop models. And then uh, there's a two part, which is the main content and the experiments. The first is uh, um, we want to test the performance of the hybrid maze model. Um, I will get into that later on a simulating soil water balance, and also test the performance of this model on simulating uh, the growth and the biomass uh, on the full and the deficit irrigation condition. And uh, at the end, I will give a conclusion. So. Um, why we want to build the irrigation app from crop models? Because irrigation is very important in the US in uh, regards to agriculture. If you look at the, the uh, western region of the United States, um, annually there's about 125 to 130 um, million dollars related to irrigation agriculture. And that's about 68% of the totally like agriculture-related production, um, which is pretty big. And uh, especially uh, when we look at the Nebraska, for every year, the irrigation-related um, agriculture activity will generate a revenue about like 13 to 14 million, a billion dollar per year in solely on Nebraska. So irrigation is very important in Nebraska. As you may know that Nebraska is the number one nationally um, irrigated wide state, and it's got 8.3 million acres. And the total economic impact is from 3.6 uh, to 6.5 billion per year. And within all those irrigation land, there's about 64% uh, is about the corn production, and the 33% per, uh, of the uh, land is about the soybean. So you can see how important the irrigation are in Nebraska and how much proportion those two major commoditized crops take in place. So we know that irrigation is important, but uh, why we want to um, solve this, tackle this problem, or solve this problem, or help irrigation by using an app? Well, in a cocky way to say, I would say, like because it's 2016, this is the best era on the computer science and the technology and the science in general. Every day, you may saw a lot of things regarding to the innovation, especially. And everyone in this room, I think one of the things most closely related to life is this. We spend so many time on this, and this have every people's attention, I would say. Even, though for, even for uh, uh, farmers, which is the average year, uh, in the U.S., 60 years old, start to use the smartphone. And they use it to check weather, check a stock market price, maybe the like, um, uh, like price of a coin and beans, and do other stuff. Um, you may argue that, um, and also that's the truth, that well, farmers in states now, they just use the phone, but I mean, they probably will never use the app on that. It's too complicated for them. I totally understand that. But uh, um, if you look at the, the new generation farmers, they use tablets, they use phones, sometimes they use them together, and sometimes they even use some like other smart device like this uh, uh, drones to collect data for their fields. And the, what it happened is there's so many data generated and they want to use this device or computer to access those data. Well, based on every app uh, prediction in 2015, they said 2016, there's going to be 87% of farmers in the U.S. going to own a smartphone. And uh, uh, last year, the actual statistic is uh, 69%. So uh, this number is growing dramatically every year. And actually, I read a report like yesterday. Turns out, in the world, 
72% of people have access to foam. This number even much higher than people can access the clean water, which is the kind of like surprising. So um, I, I really have a vision. I really like believe it's probably just like all the social media and thing. We, I really feel that the like next 10 years, although agriculture is uh, kind of behind the industry revolution on every like uh, um, uh, epic uh, 10 years, but the index 10 years, I think we will start to see more and more um, all the uh, smart platform and the smart sensors, remote sensing, drones, and uh, collect the data and uh, all those data box connect to the combine and the tractors. All those data to upload a cloud so farmer will be able to access them through their uh, smart device. I really believe that that's kind of what is going to happen. Maybe not 10 years, but uh, within 20 years. It's certainly going to be that way. Um, so that's the reason we built this coastal water app. It's an irrigation app which helps informers to make an irrigation decision on corn and soybean. And uh, this is the home page of the app. So basically, it's just like any regular website, we get a login like account. Uh, a user can register a free account to access uh, this platform. Basically, what it do is that it give farmer estimation, and uh, I will get, get back to that later. But uh, it's very intuitive. Even though for the first time user, um, if they have a question on, OK, uh, I never used this kind of technology before. How to use that? We prepare the YouTube videos to tell them step by step how to establish an account, how to use that. And we also have that uh, app in the Apple, Apple and the Google Store. They can just go and download the app. So um, what the app do, you may curious. What it actually do is it give a notification message every morning or every day when farmer logs into his account. Um, the app will suggest he or she will irrigate uh, the field he established uh, on the next 10 days. So uh, this decision, solely based on this uh, available three water lie, which is calculated on the background by the, uh, the crop model, whenever this lie drops below to this uh, dash threshold, we will see a water stress over here, which is this red lie. And then uh, the programmer turn green message to red message. OK, you crop what is the current under stress or maybe going to be under stress in the next few days. You may think about irrigation um, before that. And uh, uh, our app currently can do the 10-day uh, forecasting. Um, previously, we only can do three days, but because we get more access of weather data, so we get uh, uh, greater capability. And we have uh, 100 and, and 1,200 uh, users in our database to like uh, not actively, but to like uh, uh, probably like half of user uh, frequently use this app in the growing season. Um, what I just showed you on the graph is basically in the middle part. But if you want to know the structure of the app, actually it has more than that. First, we need a weather database, uh, basically provides daily weather data in order to enable us to do the daily simulation. Uh, the data we got is from HPRCC, which is the High Plain Region Planning Center in the Harding Hall. You may be familiar with that. Another one is the API XU, which is a commercial, uh, basically, uh, company provided the weather forecasting. And second, we will need a uh, database uh, from the soil, which is a Sergo database. I believe most of the scientists and the company uh, use this as the uh, ag practice for any technology related. Um, Things. And also, we need the, the farmer's input. This is the critical, because uh, without knowing where the farmer's fields are, we really cannot do um, much thing, because it really depends on the specific, specific environment, specific soil, and the specific practice. Like when he uh, his crop going to mature, like right in maturity day, when he plants his crop, and uh, what's the beginning of the soil moisture level going to be. So within those three pieces of information, uh, the app would use the crop models built in the background. One is for the corn, corn the uh, hybrid maize model. Another one is called the soy water, which is developed by the Dr. James Bax group uh, for the sweeping. Then those two models would take those input and do the background calculation and the generate results uh, and show that on that web page. 
my PhD dissertation, uh, dissertations are mainly focused on the, uh, this corn part. So uh, I'm just going to talk about the uh, hybrid maze model. So what is hybrid maze model? It's basically a computer program uh, developed by Dr. Yan uh, back two years ago. Uh, what it can do is uh, uh, it's operating under irrigated and green flag condition based on the daily weather data to give the evaluation of the change of yields on the different combination of planting day, hybrids, and the density. Um, but more than that, it's the main, main things we use that for the research. We want to use the current year's data and uh, also some historical norm data to do the forecasting of the yield and the maturity prediction. Um, one thing is that those two parts have been done in the past by a variety of research groups and the paper published, but we really haven't done too much on use the app to do the uh, irrigation management optimization uh, based on the capability of the uh, model to simulate soil water. So that's the reason we want to test the performance of the model on simulating soil water balance for maize. So this is the first uh, study. We test the performance uh, of hybrid maize model on this water in the uh, silk clay loam soil under the regular and the deficit irrigation. Uh, the reason we choose silk clay loam is because it's uh, kind of like a main uh, soil type in Nebraska and silk loam, silk clay loam, so we choose that. So uh, the first experiment, uh, we get the data sets in need. It's a long-term uh, study, and uh, um, I really appreciate the professor over there uh, sitting next to my advisor to provide the data sets part of that. Um, and uh, um, we have three sites. Uh, first one is the irrigated maize, up the maize. Second one is irrigated maize after sweeping. And the third one is the green fed maize after sweeping. Uh, the data sets uh, we have is uh, uh, soil water contents and the ET. And the, the, in the field, it's actually measured for depths. Uh, but uh, because the hybrid maize uh, will generate the output from 0 to 30, 30 to 60, and 60 to 100, or 120, depends on if it's uh, irrigated or rain fed. Uh, centimeters of uh, results. So we uh, kind of like uh, uh, integrate those data to those three depths to do a parallel comparison. And at the end of the comparison, we get the statistic of uh, root mean square error, um, which is the, basically how much it uh, deviated from the population mean. Mean absolute error, which is basically like in the absolute sense how much it differs from the uh, sample mean. And the mean bias error, if it's negative, it means uh, underestimate. If it's positive, it means overestimate. And the model efficiency range from the positive one to an um, infinite negative. Positive ones means the model's perfect. Infinite negative means like it's just bad if it's uh, below to zero. Yes, hopefully not. So this is our uh, data for a zero to the uh, maximum reading depths. Um, on the x-axis is day of year, y-axis of the, uh, is the daily soil water balance in millimeters. And in the rows are the three sides, and in the columns are the years. So uh, if you look, oh, by the way, those empty panels are just a sweeping field because of corn soil rotation. So in general, if you look at this whole like uh, matching up in each panel, we get actually a pretty good matchup um, in general. Uh, not only on the uh, irrigation side, but also in the wind fed side, on the uh, maximum rooting depth. Uh, although we do get some like gaps over here, for example, like 2002, at the uh, middle of the season, probably like right around the season, we start to have, have those big gaps over here. And also this wind fed set, uh, we have like a uh, dramatically increase of uh, simulated water compared to measured. But I will get into detail like why those things uh, would happen or could happen. A uh, breakdown to each soil depth. Let's first look at the, the top fit, uh, which is also uh, from a, a regularly practiced on the irrigation management. We figured out that at the beginning of the season, before the irrigation, uh, which are those green bars? Those green bars are the irrigation, and these blue bars are room fat. Uh, before the irrigation, our model seems like underestimate of soil water balance. Uh, this happens in all the irrigation fields over here almost. And then um, 
after a while, you can see that dramatically increase of the three water balance uh, when the frequently irrigated events start to happen. So um, our models kind of fluctuate a lot from like a very high to low and high again. But when we look at the, the measured data, it's actually a more kind of a, a flat in a way, not like the decrease and the increase dramatically. Um, for the rain fat side, we actually got a pretty good match up in terms of trend, I would say like this year. But this year is underestimate. This year is like overestimate. We got some fluctuating over there. Uh, next step from 30 to 60 centimeter soil depth. Um, again, the trend kind of continues. We have this simulated one, which is the uh, underestimated soil water balance uh, at the beginning of the season, especially in these 2002 very obvious. But uh, uh, when the frequent irrigation happens, it starts to like uh, increase and at the end, kind of matching up the trends uh, uh, compared with measured. And uh, uh, for the rain fat side, uh, the train we get very good matched up except over here. For those bumped up for the measured value, we probably have some leachings over there for the watermark sensors. Oh, I mean like the, uh, the TDR sensor in, installed in the lead. So uh, that's probably the bump up for the measured data. Uh, the deepest depth from the 60 to maximum rooting depth. Uh, OK, here are the things. The reason we use the, the uh, 100 centimeters for the uh, uh, irrigated side and the 120 for the green fat is because if you look at those measured values, it's kind of pretty flat. So we think that the root is maybe not present there or maybe present over there, but not taking water from that depth. So we kind of intentionally decrease the uh, rooting depth. But for the green fat, we kind of increase the rooting depth. Um, in here, the model, you can see that in the 2002, um, we do have some like underestimate of the soil water balance. Uh, for other side, uh, we have different uh, degree of underestimate of soil water balance. But uh, in general, like uh, some of the years, um, we did a good job. For the rain fat, um, we can basically catch up the trend. So um, this is basically like a three depths and a whole overview. If you're wondering that, OK, what's the statistic for the performance? Um, if you look at the pool data of this uh, uh, year size combination of 11 uh, pairs, and we figure out that the uh, model efficiency uh, is about 0.5, which is uh, uh, fairly OK. Uh, we got the root mean square errors 25, and the lean absolute errors 18, which is, uh, uh, I would say, which is fine. Um, and uh, um, I actually like think this data set is performing like uh, fairly well. Um, one thing is that, uh, uh, but the problem, okay, the problem is that how about water usage? You know, like soil water balance can kind of underestimate. Is that because we overestimate the ET because ET is water use? Then uh, we compare the, the ET results. So uh, follow the same fashions, size, year. And then the graduate simulated the black is metric. The ET, we figured out in some of the years, we do overestimate ET. And then if you look at the 2002, from here to there, we overestimate about like probably like uh, almost 100 millimeters of ET. And if you look at the, all the irrigation sites, we basically overestimate slightly. Some of them larger, some of them smaller, but basically overestimate all the uh, measured cumulated ET. And for the ring fat side, uh, however, we can underestimate ET. Oh, by the way, the ET is uh, from the uh, ethical variance, like those weather uh, station tower measurements. So the measured ET is actually measured. And the, the red one is uh, a hybrid simulated one. Um, so in summary, for the ET part, basically um, for the irrigated one, we overestimate uh, the ET. Uh, for 36, and the ring fat one we underestimated ET about like uh, 65 millimeter. Um, one thing is because this app is uh, really about like irrigation, so we can wondering that uh, if it can save farmers some waters, and we we have some notion that some of the region of Nebraska maybe farmer uh, over irrigated field they just change 
Shen Zhang whenever they can. Um, so we compared the, this regular irrigation practice and the, to the uh, app suggestion, and we basically average those numbers for all those irrigation fields. So it turns out the uh, regular practice they used uh, uh, 276 millimeters in season irrigation water, but our app only used the 180. And we actually used uh, 93 millimeters less. What it means is uh, 93 millimeters is about like a one and a quarter inch, which is kind of like one run of the irrigation. And uh, um, what happens, I'm not sure it's over here, our app actually optimized to um, tracking like what's the best time to irrigate. So we always uh, keep the available through the water line, like you see previously from the graph, to about that threshold. Um, turns out we uh, rearrange those water timing and we end up to irrigate one ground less compared to uh, what actually happens in the field. Um, so uh, this is just one side. What happens if we switch a location? Do, do we still got the violated results on a, so, a similar or same soil type? Well, we established uh, uh, field experiments in the, uh, on the east campus, just cross the bridge over there, uh, used the Dr. Aaron Lawrence cornfields in 2013 and 14, used some watermark sensor to measure the uh, water tensions at the four depths, and we used some drip tape uh, to basically set up the four and the deficit irrigation. Uh, basically, what we did is the, uh, we have that watermark sensor to uh, track the uh, uh, centibar drop. Once drop uh, around to 150, and we start to recharge the uh, first foot of the uh, soil uh, to the field capacity, we call it 100% irrigation. Uh, that's our first treatment. And the second third treatment is just 75 and 50% of 100. Basically, what we did is we turn on those three treatments at the same time, and I would we turn off the uh, drip tape for the 70 and 50% uh, earlier, and the uh, last treatment is just rinse that. Uh, we measured four depths, um, similar as the previous experiments, but what we did is we integrate those data and convert those water tension to uh, free water content and directly compare with the hybrid maze output. And at the end, we get the statistic. So uh, again, total routing depths from 0 to 150. Uh, for the 2013, we got uh, actually some underestimation for water balance for the uh, 175 or 50 percent of the irrigation. Reading that seems okay, but the uh, different story, a little bit um, interesting, is 2014. It's kind of uh, a little bit wetter than 2013. We, do, we have this, like, a uh, soil water balance increase in the season, which is caused, like, totally overestimate of soil water balance. Um, and then we to, want to see, like, each depth in details. We find that the Compared to the uh, previous experiments, the same depth, uh, the hypermaze models underestimate soil water balance at the beginning, and then we never have uh, irrigation occur, we have those overestimation, and then the light just bumped up in all the irrigation treatment. They don't have a much differ, but I think the differ you will see is that this is the sharp increase because we have more irrigation waters over here. And with the same frequency, less irrigation water, uh, this increases just more gradually. Uh, in 2014, if you look at that, the simulated, this red light is more fluctuating up and down. But it's kind of like in the upper high level of 90 millimeters on the uh, total water uh, total routine zone. I mean, in the 0 to 30. So it's kind of like more water at that uh, layers. Uh, ring that looks OK. Um, for the 30 to 60, uh, we do we didn't did a very good job on over there because uh, we can see that the totally underestimate of uh, a soil water balance across all depths. Ring that looks okay, but uh, um, we do need to figure out why in the middle layers we underestimate soil water balance. Is that because uh, something in the model, or is that because the uh, water use we simulate too much water use? Um, I will get back to that later. Actually, we have a, a pretty good uh, explanation, I believe. And for the uh, last depth from 60 to rooting depth, basically what we have is uh, um, 
we actually see it pretty well. Um, and the, the things different on campus field is uh, even for the uh, deepest measurement, the install sensor from like 120, and then it still have a decrease of uh, those action measures through water. So we're seeing the routing gaps is like 150 when we do the simulation. Um, for the statistic of this study on the Lincoln, uh, we find out that our model efficiency is about 0.7, which is pretty good. And then root mean square earth is 34. And the last one is 25. So like average, we got like 30 millimeter of uh, uh, root mean square air differ from the mean population. I would say like uh, it's, it's acceptable. So in summary of this two study about the water, what we found is the hybrid based model can simulate well on the total routing depths for the soil water balance. And it's overestimate water balance at the top 30 centimeters but to underestimate water balance at the 60 centimeter to the routing gaps. Uh, for the ET part, we slightly overestimate ET in the wind uh, irrigated field and underestimate for the wind gap field. And we found out the maze model saved the irrigation water by 93 millimeter during the five seasons compared with the actual irrigation schedule. So those water is fun. Uh, but still, I haven't answered the question of uh, why um, overestimate top 30 uh, centimeters through water, but they kind of underestimate for the below top 30. So it turns out the reason could be we use uh, this uh, piston bucket method for the water recharging process. So what it happens in the piston bucket is uh, uh, when you have a water input, either for the rainfall or the irrigations, the water starts recharging. In the program, what it happens, it's filling up the top 30 uh, centimeters so the water will not going down until the first 30 centimeter reach the field capacity. But in reality, in the real world, this is not the case. Because whenever you have a water input events, it's always going to infiltrate to deeper levels. So it happens spontaneously for recharging the top soil layers and also like relatively lower soil layers. So that's what happened. Uh, whenever we had the irrigation events, you see those slides just bump up dramatically. It's because um, all the water is on the top layers. But in the reality, those water is actually going down. So you see the measure is kind of like lower than the simulated one. And because of that, we have uh, more waters on the top layer. Uh, in the model, in the sub layer from 30 to 60, we turned out have less water. So you saw those like dramatically decrease of simulation lines compared to what actually measured on that layer. And the, the, the solution, the possible solution is that we can change our uh, second bucket method to this recharge equation. What it's do is that it's actually uh, more realistically to simulate the uh, hydraulic, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity in the soil. So it will be more um, in a like, realistic way to uh, mimic how the water moves on different soil layers. Now, um, we know like the hybrid maze model can do the water simulation, but how about biomass? Uh, we still need to figure out uh, if it can simulate the growth of the biomass well uh, for the crop. So what we did is that we compared the simulated and the measured biomass on uh, the crops, uh, simulated and the measured crop stage, LAI, total biogram mass, and the green yield under those uh, full and deficit irrigation uh, conditions. The reason we do that is because in the modeling, um, in every day's process, the water balance and the, the uh, biomass simulations are close related. And uh, uh, not only just those equations, but uh, in the real world, we know like a soil water relation. Uh, Dr. Tim uh, Aqua. Uh, well, I mean, like we, we have the soil water relation course. We know that if we don't have a, a adequate water during the, uh, for example, kernel setting period, uh, the core will potentially uh, reduce the kernel number at the end of the uh, harvesting. And also, it can lead to the early leaf senescence if uh, it's getting too dry at the end of the season. And we know if we don't have enough waters um, during the season, it will affect the photosynthetic rate, and uh, it's further affected uh, hydraulic 
uh, high carbon hydrate allocation, then uh, the leaf extension and the biomass accumulation for different organ will be affected. So in our model process, we really want to make sure um, if this part simulate OK, and also water simulate OK, and in general, we can have a, a good model. Um, same experiment as that uh, previous experiment, just the differ is we uh, collect the data of a stage, LAI, total background biomass, and green yield. Um, let's look at some like environment uh, data, because we believe that that will affect our uh, final results. It's uh, um, 2013. Uh, the uh, field is being planned in uh, May 8, but 2014 actually we planned uh, 10 days later. But it turns out, you see those flip of GDD, uh, these slides over here. Turns out that 2013, 14 is over here, which is this brown line, it's actually mature earlier than the 2013s. So what it uh, happens is uh, this is the following day, 16 days. After that, um, the 2014 is actually a little bit hotter, so it's accumulated GDD faster. Turns out it's mature earlier. But 2014, because the GDD is relatively lower, the accumulated the GDD is kind of uh, have longer days, so it's grow longer. This is the one thing about the GDD. And uh, uh, another thing about the water input, we see like 2014 have a slightly 15 more millimeters of water than 2013s. Um, the things we specifically interested is after seeking this uh, water input because we're wondering that um, if that will affect our uh, model performance uh, capabilities. So um, if you look at the 2013s, we only have uh, 53 millimeters of water compared to 2014. After the filtering, we got to 200, almost like 250 millimeters of water. So 2014, after the filtering, it's got a bunch, I mean, sufficient waters, but the 2013, we don't have that much. That's a reason we irrigate more in 2013. In general, like, uh, we kind of try to balance the two year in a sense, but uh, actually in the second year, uh, for the irrigated and the after silking rainfall, the total water input after silking, uh, the 2014 have a relative more compared to 2013 when you compare with the each uh, treatment respectively. Now let's look at some results. For uh, this is the simulation of a crop stage compared to the observed. The x-axis is the day of year. The y-axis is the crop stage. And for the row is years, and the column is the treatment. Um, there's one thing is uh, because the observed uh, stage is the same across all the treatment, so we merged all the data together in this column. Another thing is uh, because the simulation is based on the GDD in the model, so there's no difference for simulated across stage in both uh, irrigated and the ring fat treatment. Upper left side is the uh, vegetative stage. Lower bottom is the reproductive stage. And the red is simulated, and then black is the uh, measure uh, observed. So uh, the one thing we find in 2013 is that uh, we have about like four or five days deeper for the uh, certain day simulation. And we actually simulate the certain day earlier. What turns out to be is that because this differ at the end of the R6, the physiological maturity, we actually did not do a job. We actually simulated the maturity 15 days earlier compared to what actually observed in the field. What th this can, uh, because uh, one reason is the uh, first year we don't have much experiments when we observe the uh, R6. So we probably will observe R6 a little bit late than what it actually happens in the field, uh, because the black layer is kind of hard to see. And uh, for the ring fat, uh, we actually get a better matchup for the uh, R1, which is the flowering day, and the R6, we still have some differs uh, over here, which is, which is 10 to 15 days. Um, and the, keep in mind that this is a kind of relative dry year. And 2014, we get a better matchup 
not only for the uh, vegetative stage, but also reproductive stage. Now, uh, LAI. Um, in two years, all the treatment, we overestimated LAI by almost one. So in the field, the LAI measured by a portable like Lycor device is about like about four, and the second year is about like 4.5. But uh, um, in the first year, we really overestimated LAI. And uh, uh, there's uh, some like slight differs uh, in the different treatment, but uh, um, we didn't do a good job in the first year. Second year, we actually did much better. You can see that the train is kind of matching up uh, for those simulated one with red, and those black dots is the natural one. Well, we kind of have this like dent over here, but I think it's probably due to like some measured error. Um, in general, we catch up the train. And more importantly, we catch up this point, which is the kind of the maximum uh, of the canopy extension right after the uh, flowering days, and uh, which indicate that we can the model can catch up the, the like uh, not only flowering day but also the trends of like during that period of time you get a, a plateau and then gradually decrease of the LAI. About ground biomass in the season. Uh, we actually did a good job on simulating in season uh, biogram biomass in two years. But the one thing that we didn't do pretty well uh, is at the end of the season, you can see we dramatically underestimate the biomass, uh, the biogram biomass measurement. So uh, you may notice that why uh, we start lie over here, but the measure is over here, it's about like a two week deeper. Um, the reason because we want to the crop to drier then do the harvesting and to do the, all the seed processing and stuff. But the, the main thing is that if the company told us the uh, relative maturity of the crop is the one or two days, if this hybrid, which is also still in the uh, testing pro process, will grow uh, two weeks later, we actually will get, for the model to grow two weeks, we get a pretty good like uh, matchup for those above ground biomass. And uh, another thing is uh, another reason we underestimate total about uh, ground biomass is because we underestimate the green yield in all the treatments in two years. Uh, in this graph, you see that the red one is simulated one and the black one is the measured one. We cross a different treatment that we underestimated the uh, green yield biomass at 15% uh, percent moisture, and especially uh, for the rainfall treatment. For irrigated one, we probably underestimate about like 1.7 megaton per uh, megagram per hectare. Green fat probably over two um, two megagram per hectare. Uh, 2014, um, we did a little bit better job, and and the, for the green fat and the, it's kind of matching a little bit better, but still uh, we have those differs. If you're wondering that, what's the statistic of that? Um, this, this part is about biomass. Um, so we actually uh, underestimated the uh, yield by 1.7 microgram per hectare and uh, in, in general of all the treatments. And uh, uh, also the simulation is not that good because it's already a negative one. So we certainly need to improve the uh, capability to simulate biomass under those tre irrigation treatments. Uh, LAI in the pool data, um, we overestimate our AI by one almost, and the model can barely simulate uh, our AI. So this part we certainly need to improve. Uh, for the model efficiency, uh, this value is pretty high. It's due to the fact that in season we uh, simulate those in season biomass well, but at the season uh, we didn't do a good job, which result this uh, 3.2 microgram per hectare uh, of uh, uh, deeper for the uh, mean bias area. So in summary, those biomass uh, study, and uh, we found that LAI, uh, we found out the hybrid maze model simulate stage well under the wet year, which is the 2014, and then it's over as the LAI in general, and it simulate in season above ground biomass well, but underestimate of uh, above ground biomass at harvesting, and uh, it's underestimate the green yield, and it's the performance of this model. Uh, we believe that it's not solely affected by the water input, 
in the season, but more about the climate effect, like the GDD accumulation, like when, how much GDD is accumulated at a certain period of time, and also depends on the water input their location during the season, if it's before the flowering or after the flowering. So in conclusion of these two studies, the maize model part in the course of water app can estimate well for the water uh, content at the rooting depths for a silk clay long soil. And uh, uh, the simulation of water balance at the specific layers, that's the part we still need to improve as we show in different layers. And we believe the hybrid maize model can be used for irrigation scheduling for silk clay loam um, soil type in Nebraska. And uh, um, at the end, we still need to improve the crop growth and the biomass stimulation in order to make this model more robust. So uh, what's next? Uh, as we know that we move from the arrow of a dot .exe executable file to an arrow of like the app age or new app age of all website app all over the place on your phone. So what's the next what we can do? Well, actually, there's a lot of industry uh, practice right now as build this thing called API, Application Programming Interface. It, if you think about that, this is kind of like a waiter when you dining in the restaurant, communicate you to the kitchen directly. You are the user and the kitchen are the program. So it will make communication between two. This thing is like a plugger. So if we make it as a plugger, it can plug in any of the technology platform. It can be used a, a wider range and a, a different grading and a different market. So I'm actually in the process of like trying to licensing this from the UNL, and in the future, hopefully, can work on some business with different companies and uh, reach a bigger market based on the user base. Um, with that, uh, I really want to thank Dr. Yan with the four years uh, guidance on this and always encourage me to just think brave and also think critical like a, a crop modeler. A doctor is always like a, a father figure to me and I really appreciate that this four year education. Uh, thank you Dr. Yen. And uh, also I want to thank uh, my committee member Dr. Henry has always gave me uh, critical advice on the irrigation part and they give me a lot of insight and, and the opportunity for teaching your class and really appreciate it. And Dr. Grassini always gave me critical advice and uh, helped me to like to become better research. So I really appreciate that. And Dr. Harbour provide our neat data set and I really appreciate that. Um, and for the grad students, thank Dominic, Rakish, and Babak, and uh, especially uh, for those team. Uh, we spent lots of hours to work on this app, especially the first two years while work with Dominic and we spent so many nights, overnight in the office, and they try to debug the model. And this is the, I think this is the, will be the basic experience we have. And the, without Dummit, there won't be this app in here. This is the core of the technology part. Um, all the secretaries, although some of them are not here, thank you, Judy, to set up things, and uh, Marlene, Kathy, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of other people, and then helping grad students we just lost. And the Dr. Speck, thank you so much, Dr. Speck, uh, to teach me to how to install uh, water mark sensors in the field. And uh, if we install, you know that if you install the sensors wrong, the experiment just toasted. So Dr. Speck took me to the field, and I showed a video on that, by the way. So if you guys don't know how to install water mark sensor, so uh, check on that YouTube video. And the Dr. Speck, thank you so much for uh, promoting this app. And uh, uh, Dr. David Lam for the entrepreneurship, appreciate that. And I also want to thank Dr. Aaron Lorenz for the field. And also um, thank you, Steve Young, to bring me to United States this land. And the last I want to thank um, Sharon and Paul and Nicholas. And thank you so much for taking care of me and the friendship. And the thank you, uh, Corn and Boys, Corn Boy, um, uh, Corn Boy and Soybean Board and the Energy Resource Center. And with that, I take any questions. Thank you very much, James. But uh, well, before I would call for questions, uh, since this is a kind of a summary of this uh, course, uh, course of work project, personally, 
I would like that to start. So he's a kind of a, let's say, everything he, he has done throughout the whole year, including the last part after his retirement, because uh, he retired just on paper, never in his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I really want to understand him for his encouragement, uh, for his guidance, and uh, critical kind of uh, thinking and pushing, and uh, sometimes you just feel the pounding. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, next question. I'll just open with one. Okay. If you slow to show the slide of your biomass prediction and yes. your simulator of nature. Make a distinction between a believer, no, further back where you actually show the simulation. Okay, above ground, yeah. That's one of them. If, if you look at your at your simulation there, mm -hmm. you see between the years you're simulating about the same thing. So you see it, you look at the bottom red line, 2014 on the left, mm -hmm. goes to about 20, and also goes to about 20 in 2013. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you, you were saying you did a better prediction in 2013 than in 2014, but technically when I look at this, I see the simulation being the same both years. That the data is just better matching in 2013. Mm -hmm. So it's just the difference between a believer like yourself and a model and a skeptic. Not that it's bad, you did a great job. I compliment you. A lot of graduate students could learn from the way you presented this and defined your slides and how you presented a lot of data in the nice, nice framework. I congratulate you on that. Very well done. Thank you. If this is, is this still like, yes. If you were going to take this to the grower and you, you've had several conclusions that say we need to improve this aspect of this model or this aspect, mm -hmm. what does the grower need to have that would help validate or guide your model throughout the year to ground treat it? Or do you need that? Are you going solely off the model and trusting the model? Well, um, Certainly, we, you know, like every model is based on the assumption. Uh, I'm okay. So every model is based on the assumption. Um, we know that we have this model on the zero gradient slowly high, but uh, uh, still we have so many things to test in order to make sure um, the model working, uh, for example, like further west, if we get a more sandy uh, soil type, like what we can do on that. Um, we certainly need more tests, but uh, um, one thing is that we know that whenever you change it to any of the fields, you always going to have some like off. And the, the off can be reason of the soil, it can be other reasons we don't know. So the idea actually is boiled down of what's the next, what we can do to make this thing actually better. Um, my vision actually is uh, we want to build this API. And the way we handle is that um, we use this API to give those companies which have already have like uh, agribusiness integration platforms on the uh, product, like uh, FarmLog, Climate Corp, or like FarmEdge, so for all those companies. And uh, if they can plug this one in those systems, and uh, basically they already ask farmers to provide the information settles, such as that's a uh, common one, like planting base and the population things. Farmer can easily plug in on that. So um, if we can get the simulation results from them, and they already have some like ground truth data, so we will have a bigger coverage of uh, use those to like make the model a better one. To add to that, mm -hmm. they, they would have maybe a one-to-one -one sensor or some other type mm -hmm. of sensor. Yes. Put that feedback into your model. Mm -hmm. Post-correct. Post-correct. The hard part is the different source of uh, data, because you know that the TDR watermark or whatever other or even Newton probe, if you collect all those data, but uh, when you fade in the system, there's a lot of process, probably 90% about cleaning up the data and making the format. How to make this process automatic is really the key. And then um, if we can do that, putting a way of farm upload, uh, let's say watermark download from the uh, data loggers, automatically it generates a form to uh, Easy for us to process compared with the model simulation, or we can use different algorithms to actually calibrate those data um, 
And uh, in that process, we do need to like uh, to make this uh, model portable to our device. It's the majority of calls I get from farmers without an integrated water part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I have two questions. They're, they're related, so I'll ask them together. Mm -hmm. the, the first one relates to how how certain are you sure that the servo data you used for that field was, was right for those soils? And, and the second one, you shouldn't feel too bad about using the tipping bucket rainfall, rain gauge approach because um, in Circa with Pioneer, a field mm -hmm. view with uh, Climate Corp, they use the same procedure. Mm -hmm. and, and do you um, have the data to put it into the Richards equation mm -hmm. to, to demonstrate that in fact, that's what was happening. Mm. What you're responding? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's say we are not uh, well, we are not the only one that is bad. We're equally bad. <laughs> 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 well, Professor, I, after that, I need to talk to you with more about that part. Yes, I'm interested. But thank you for letting me know. Okay, you want to my question about the server data? Oh, right. With regard to server data, um. I think um, it's going to be uh, it's the best available for the industry production, and uh, we know that it's never going to be the case. It's going to be different. Um, in order to make an improve of that, I think we're either going to rely on the uh, yield map. That is one thing so we know, like actually what's yield going to be, and another one is certainly the remote sensing. Um, but you've got all those data layers and the connected problem disproportionately from different regions, different organizations. Um, again, I believe that the, the best way is that if you can plug in those one in the integrated system, which is already have someone doing that. Um, for example, like remote sensing product, I know one company like the uh, position part, they have different algorithms to do the simulation and then they plug in the data layers to that, and then I think that will be a good collaboration or like a good like uh, good like uh, in a way to say, okay, you only have server, but I have this layer to do the adjustment. And I believe in the Purdue University, there's a group of uh, professors. They actually not use server. He, rather than that, he's doing the things to uh, say like how the crop behave and the water uh, behave in a certain of a layer. I think he, he did it in Africa. I forget his name, but I mean, like, yes, Servo is not the best source, but that's the best source of rubber right now for the in industry. Yep. Yeah. Um, just want to follow up on Jim's comment about model believers or a skeptical. <laughs> um, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm going to move forward the discussion on that uh, because, in a way, a model represents 40, 50 years of basic crop physiology research. So if the model fails, it's because there is something that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when I see something like that, I want to understand what's the part that we don't understand well, or mm -hmm. what's the part of, re of reality that we are not capturing with the model, or with the mathematical routines behind the model. So, mm -hmm. for example, in that case of above ground biomass, it's very clearly that in the two years you are underestimating biomass. But if you go one slide back, then you may get an answer for that. You can see how the leaf area that you measure compares with the leaf area that you simulate, and you can see that during the whole grain, grain filling, you are predicting a much faster senescence compared with what happened in the reality. So that kind of figures provides you with an insight about what may be the, the un underlying processes that we may not be understanding well and for which uh, perhaps we need to do more basic research. So instead of maybe focusing the discussion too much about the model matching or not matching, perhaps it's more constructive to talk in terms of what are the specific physiological processes that we don't understand well and for which we may need to do more research. Again, my question mm -hmm. lies there. If you take those soft red lights and super them on the top, they're nearly identical. Mm -hmm. It's not the server data that's different. Uh, we, yes, we actually use the uh, generic like, uh, parameter settings. So um, this one is a kind of like a dry resistance uh, hybrid. And we, we hope we can get the uh, setting of uh, this specific uh, um, hybrid and uh, probably we will get better results. But uh, um, yes, again, like those data are not currently available right now. We have a different approach to do, which I think it's really 
uh, rely on like uh, the help of uh, have a platform and have other one to upload some like ground truths regard to what hybrid they use and then to do the um, this kind of like collaboration. And I believe that uh, there's a multiple way to calibrate the model and uh, um, use ground truths to do collaboration and then we figure out, okay, what's the ground or what's the parameter can be adjusted for this specific model. But I know like to, because the computer science now uh, just developed so fast and there's a lot of people use the, uh, for example, one of the machine learning algorithms and uh, neural neural network, uh, the, the recursive network, neural network, you basically can use massive data to uh, improve your algorithm uh, to reach the plateau uh, lesser. And in order to have those process happen, uh, we need to uh, launch data source. And I think it's not uh, can be done by the individual to just ask, uh, do you have data? Do you have, do you have data in a way? But rather than done in a production level, which like then uh, integrate the data in a central hub and then process it back with the team. Okay, last question from the audience. Oh, yes. uh, not trying to get into the nitty gritty of the of the program, but you your trials were in practically flat areas, surfaces, and you still see some uh, differences between observed and predicted for the different layers of sampling. Mm -hmm. Nebraska is not precisely a flat land, it's very variable, and when you have storms, you have a lot of water runoff. Do you have in the model something to adjust for for the, you know, the conditions of the soils? Uh, if it's uh, flat or if it's a slope oh, or something? Yes, we have a function in the hybrid maze model. You can specify the slope of the water, uh, but in terms of the Wrong of, I think we have certain limited capability to uh, have that component taken into mind, uh, taking in the mind. But we don't have a capability to consider of the durancy and intensity of the uh, uh, water, uh, like the rainfall at a short period of time. So that I think that part could be critical because that's the part that you affect the wrong of most. Yeah, uh, one comment is that we have it, but. Uh, we have uh, probably one of the best, but one of the best may not be good enough. <laughs> well, I have a final question. Yes. Uh, it's fundamental to me. Yes. Uh, your title is, uh, is uh, from a zero to here. Mm -hmm. And then you, you show that uh, uh, 40 plus slides. So that means that there are many steps that go from uh, zero to here. Among so many steps, which one is most critical? To reach the field from there. Well, uh, I, I mean, like honestly speaking, I think that it's the uh, uh, the last step to build the um, like uh, startup, which make it commercialized to access a bigger audience and to collect more data and to get more capital to industrialize. I think that's the most critical one because once you make it work and it extends, no matter how bad it is, if you can move the needle a little bit and the better than previously a little bit, then um, things are going to start to happen. Uh, but uh, if we, uh, if I just like to collect another data set, do a collaboration, change the parameter, and do that over and over again, uh, in a sense of it probably won't have much impact if it can work with someone, have a much uh, like a bigger audience, and then access more resource, and to, to make it in a way to uh, make people to realize the way this one who can generate the uh, agribusiness inside in the future. Then I think that's the, that's, I feel that that's the way to go. Okay, with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, your dinosaur is here, the big red F set. <laughs> 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 <laughs>